Welcome to today's webinar on the New England Vital Records available through NEHGS. My name is Geneva Morse, the Online Education Coordinator at the New England Historic Genealogical Society. I'll be moderating today's event. NEHGS is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer this webinar today for our members and friends around the world. Giving today's presentation will be David Allen Lambert, our Chief Genealogist. He's been with the Society for more than 20 years and is an expert in New England and Atlantic Canadian research, military records, and Native American and African American genealogical research. He'll start by discussing the basics of New England vital records and then provide a snapshot for each state. He'll go over what vital record databases we offer at AmericanAncestors.org along with some general search tips. He'll also highlight additional resources we have at the NEHGS library here in Boston. And finally, he'll talk about some vital record substitutes. At any time during the presentation, please feel free to type a question in the panel to the right of your screen. David will answer as many as he can in the last 15 to 20 minutes of the hour. If you don't see that question box, you can expand the user panel by clicking on the icon of a white arrow with an orange background. It looks like this. This event is being recorded and the video will be posted to our website in the next couple of days. So without further ado, let's get started. Take it away, David. Thank you, Ginevra. I am delighted to have a chance to reach out to some of our patrons of NEHS via this exciting new service using a webinar. We are very fortunate at NEHS to have resources both online and in-house that cover New England vital records from the early 17th century to through the 21st century in most cases. New England vital records come in many formats, maybe a manuscript, a book, a microfilm, CD-ROM, one of the many databases we have on our website, AmericanAncestors.org. Let's go over some of the basics. The region known as New England consists of the states of Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont. New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania are occasionally confused with being part of New England. Unfortunately, this is not the case. In New England, vital records are recorded at the town level. There are, however, some cases where counties would record marriages, but for the most part, you can locate the birth, marriages, and deaths within the town or city hall of most New England towns. In most cases, the earliest records for these towns and facilities are also preserved in the collections of their local state archive facilities. For the majority of New England towns, there has been some form of vital record keeping since the settlement or the incorporation of the town. So, you will often be able to access records from the 1600s in one format or another at NEHGS for most cities and towns in New England. Every state has different restrictions regarding the most current records that they possess. Our databases and holdings reflect that. For example, the state of Massachusetts has a 92-year restriction on access. You can obtain these records from the state, city, or town. However, you will not find them at NEHGS or anywhere online currently. So the records, for instance, 1921 to 1925 birth, marriages, and deaths will not be made public until 2017. The fifth edition of the Genealogist Handbook for New England Research is a good resource to have in your personal genealogical library, and it provides information on where to access vital records for each of the New England states from the 17th century until now. This new edition includes a chapter for each state that includes how-to information, contact information for the repositories, and which are holding a variety of records for use for a genealogist or historian. In each state chapter, there are town tables, which list every town in the state, along with its year of incorporation, county, parent, and daughter towns, notes on if the town had a previous name, or as part of an earlier settlement or plantation and also information on the vital records, church records for that town. Now, I'm going to show you an example here of one of the towns. We'll go to the town of Arundel. 
Now, Arundel was incorporated in 1915 as County York. It's the parent town of Kennebunkport. And the additional notes here tell us that Kennebunkport was called Arundel between 1719 and 1821 and called North Kennebunk to 1957. So there's some notes that will be valuable to your research. It will also mention if the records were published are available in manuscript form or available as a database on AmericanAncestors.org. Another nice feature of this book are the nearly 80 maps that show state, county, town, and sometimes county boundaries. This is a great source to find the abutting communities of individual towns. Many towns, as I had mentioned, were created out of larger districts or abutting towns, so this may give you a clue for where earlier vital records of the towns that you should look at. AmericanAncestors.org features over 2,000 databases. We have scholarly journals, periodicals from New England, the Mid-Atlantic, and beyond. We have unique military records for all the colonial wars and the Grand Lodge of Masons in Massachusetts membership database. We also have one-of-a-kind transcripts of diaries and much, much more. Another project we're working on is that is a unique to AmericanAncestors.org is our Early Families of New England Study Project. This database continues where the Great Migration leaves off and provides sketches for mid to late 17th century immigrants. Today I'm going to focus on vital record, church, and cemetery record databases we have online and other resources we have available here at NEHGS in Boston. There are four different types of results you'll see on our website. You may find an index, a transcription of an original, uh, a further transcription that is done as a published transcription of the original into a book, or the original record itself. Most of the databases I'm going to talk to you about today can only be accessed by current NEHGS members. We do, however, have a free program in which guest users can access about 15 databases on AmericanAncestors.org. We also offer temporary access to databases which were just launched or expanded. For example, since we are adding regularly to the Barber Collection, a database I'll go over in a little bit, guest users will have access to that on a month-to-month -month basis. In addition to our website offerings, our research library and archives holds 30,000 published genealogies, 40,000 local histories and records, 5,000 journals and periodicals, 12,000 rare books, millions of manuscript items, millions of records on microform, reference works, compilations, guidebooks, and more. Again, today I'm just going to highlight the published local histories and microforms which you can contain vital records for New England, so stay tuned for more presentations on the above. We will now have an overview of the variety of databases you can find on AmericanAncestors.org to assist you with New England vital records. We offer 225 New England vital record databases online. Combined, this totals over 29 million individual records. A couple databases you may be interested in searching combine all of the New England states. This includes over 490,000 gravestone inscriptions from the New England cemeteries from our NEHGS manuscript collections and the well-respected compilation of marriages prior to 1700, known as Tories New England Marriages. Tories New England Marriages prior to 1700. This is the an exhaustive work that was compiled by the late genealogist Clarence Allman Torrey and is one of the most utilized manuscripts at NEHGS. Through his careful research, he enumerated nearly 99% of the married couples of pre-1700 New England. In many cases, this includes the place and date of marriage or the earliest known date associated with their marriage. This is often calculated from a year of birth or a child from this couple when they were born a passenger list, or a secondary marriage to another spouse. The marriage dates and places are not restricted to New England and may often list dates that occurred in England.
Here is an example of how to search this database on American ancestors. For this example, I'm going to start with a broad search. I have typed in Dearborn in the last name field. Click on Dearborn for you. Here we are. And in the last name field, so what I will do then next is I already know a little bit about the Dearborns, so I'm not going to add in any additional information. So I'm going to search broadly on Dearborn. And then I'm going to search on the category of vital records and then select the pull down database till I get Tories New England marriages prior to 1700. After making these selections, I'll then click search on the lower right hand side of your screen and this will allow me to go forward to the record. Now just keep in mind there are also search tips that you want to search on our databases. Now on this screen here I now have the results of the 10 matches from Tories uh, database which is on AmericanAncestors.org, one of the uh, most popular databases we have. And this will show me information about Godfrey Dearborn. So I'm going to now click on to view. And what is now on my screen are the results of the entry for Godfrey Dearborn. It lists his life dates and the fact he was married to an unknown spouse in 1632 in England and that she was still living in 1650. The next batch of text gives me the titles of the individual resources Tory used to identify this couple. Most all of the sources that Tory used can be utilized at NEHGS because that is where he used them himself to compile this. And in some cases these are even online. You can also hire the NEHGS photocopy service to copy entries if you cannot get to the library to do so yourself. If you're not familiar with the abbreviated entry for the title, you can download a PDF of his source list. As you can see right here, read the guide to Tori's source references in PDF format. Clicking on that will then bring up the source list for you. This source list contains the title, author, and publication information for the sources we just saw in the entry for Godfrey Dearborn and his unknown spouse. Now that we've introduced some of the generally used New England databases on American ancestors, I would like to acquaint you with the sources we have state by state. We'll start with Connecticut. Marriages in Connecticut were recorded as early as 1640. Birth, marriage, and death records are also recorded by towns, and in most cases are starting shortly after the incorporation of the community. In 1870, a State Board of Health was established in Connecticut to help the compilation of vital records. And starting in 1897, vital records at the town level were requested to have copies sent to the state. So there would be a duplicate copy, which is true in mostly all the New England states. On American Ancestors, we have 47 vital record databases containing over 833,000 records for Connecticut. This includes the ongoing effort to place the Connecticut Vital Records to 1870 from the Barber Collection online, which I'll talk to you a little bit later. Other databases include 9,400 entries for Connecticut marriages and deaths from 1792 to 1837. We also have 29 Vital Record and 16 Church databases, which are for specific towns which contain themselves over 200,000 entries. The Barber Collection is one of the most popular resources we have for New England. And for Connecticut resources, it is usually the first place that people start. And the ACS is actively working on completing the Barber Collection on our website completely. The source of our version is a TypeScript of Lucius Barnes Barber's exhaustive transcriptions that which were donated by his widow to NEHGS. This collection contains vital records from roughly the 1640s to circa 1870. The original collection contained 136 volumes and we currently have 112 volumes searchable on American ancestors with 24 volumes projected to be online by the end of the year. We shall have the entire collection online for you very shortly.
Now I'm going to show you an example on how to search Barber using AmericanAncestors.org. Here's the example. For this example, I am going to select the surname of child. I've entered this into the last name field. Under category, I will then again select vital records. Under database, I will select Connecticut vital records to 1870, the Barber collection. And then under further down, I am going to select the town under volume. A pull down menu will allow me to select the town. In this case, I'm selecting Woodstock, Connecticut. After making these selections, I have clicked the, the search button again in the lower right hand side of the screen. And keep in mind, there are also our search tips here for you to look at if you need additional help. So we're going to click search and our results will appear. My search has produced 232 vital record matches in the Barber collection for the surname of child and I have narrowed these down um, by adding more details. Now you can do any refine by in the upper right hand corner so you can add a first name or a date range but for this example I will just select the second entry. This is for Aaron Child from the list of results who died in Woodstock in 1851. I'm going to click on view and now I will be given an image of the page. And this is an actual example of the Barber transcript page for the town of Woodstock. Aaron Child can be found right here on the top line. He died April 30th, 1851, age 76 years. And on the right hand side, uh, usually it's volume and page. In this case, it's page and volume. This is actually the citation to the volume and page in which his vital record shows up on volume 7, page 286 in the Woodstock vital record. So if you would want to see the original, and that brings up my first tip. I would always suggest seeking out the original primary source for any record. Now the previous example showed you the volume and page, volume 7, page 286. I would go and obtain the microfilm or in fact consult with the town clerk because as wonderful as Barbara is, you want to see the original in your research just in case you might have a question on the spelling of a name or a double date or if you believe that maybe you might have a better idea of what date that person was born, married, and died. Why not look for the original? And this, with Barber, gives you that opportunity because everything is cited. At NEHTS, we have other vital record resources for you to use for Connecticut as well. These include two other versions of Barber, not just our online, but this is the statewide alphabetical index on microfilm. This is located in our fourth floor microtext department here in Boston. There's also the Barber Collection TypeScripts, one of which is in our archives, which we've used to provide the scans and the database that we just chatted about, and also a town-by-town -town printed TypeScript located on the seventh floor. There's also another valuable database I should talk about because we include church records into the fold of vital records for today. It's a Connecticut church records, an index from the Connecticut State Library as a wonderful alternative to looking for the sacramental records on your ancestor and perhaps the vital records are not able to be found or to complement them. So try those. Those are also on the fourth floor microtext department collections. We're now going to talk about the great northerly state of Maine. Maine was formed as a, as a district from Massachusetts before becoming a state. Now, Maine has very early settlements in the 17th century. In fact, some cases, the records are preserved from these very early communities. In 1892, the state of Maine required that every city and town send a copy of their birth, marriage, and death returns to the capital in Augusta, Maine. There was also a request to have earlier records copied and returned to the state as delayed entries. Now, this was a great idea, and these pre-1892 were returned, but only from 72 towns. So I'll talk about some other published options that may fill in the blanks if you're not lucky enough to have ancestors in these 72 communities. On American Ancestors, we have over 43 vital record databases containing over 1.4 million records for Maine. This includes Maine Marriage Index, 1892 to 1966, and also 1977 to 1996. This has over 856,000 records. 
The main death index of 1960 to 1996 includes 400,000 records itself. We also have 32 vital record databases and nine church record databases, which are again town specific, and this includes over 200,000 records. At NEHGS, we have other resources, like I said before, for using vital records in Maine. This includes microfilm of the returns of pre-1892 vital records for the 72 towns, and we also have a variety of individual rolls of microfilm and pre-1892 vital records that were published in book form for specific towns. The books are located on the fifth floor, and all microfilms are again on the fourth floor. For recent vital records, we have statewide main vital records from 1892 to 1955. This also includes a bride index that covers the years 1896 to 1966 on microfilm because the straight vital records only list down through the name of the grooms. So if you know a bride's name and you're not sure who the groom is, this bride's index may be a valuable resource for you. Now let's talk about the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Back in 1639, there was legislation that required that the cities and towns keep birth, marriage, and death records with their town records. And in most cases, the 17th century town records and vital records of Massachusetts are a tremendous resource. Going ahead a couple of centuries, in 1841, the state of Massachusetts required that copies of birth, marriage, and death be sent to the Secretary of State's office. From then on, both the state and the city and the towns held a duplicate copy of their records. This is for a couple of reasons, one for vital record statistic keeping, and it also provided a secondary copy in case the town hall or the city hall burned. Now the place that really was not good at this was the great city of Boston, unfortunately. By the 1850s, Boston was doing a little bit better recording the birth, marriages, and deaths, but there are instances where you do not find hardly any births recorded in the 1840s at all. In fact, the book that of the recorded births of Boston from 1800 to 1848 is less than an inch thick. Not until the later 19th century was the place of burial or the name of the cemetery included on the state copy of the returns of death. So in some cases, you may want to seek out the original town or city's version of the vital record. We offer 89 vital record related databases on AmericanAncestors.org for Massachusetts with over 15 million records. This includes the official series of Massachusetts vital records to 1850. Known commonly as the TAN books, these include over 2.5 million records. The state of wide Massachusetts vital records are also searchable on our website for the years 1841 to 1910 and then a separate database for 1911 to 1915. This itself contains 10 million records you can search. We also have the Massachusetts Statewide Death Index from 1970 to 2003 with over 2 million records. There are also 59 vital record and 20 church record databases applicable to a specific city or town in, this, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. You can also search six cemetery record databases from Massachusetts online at American Ancestors, and this includes 81,000 entries. As you can see, uh, both the tan books, you know, the majority of these pre-1850 volumes are the color tan, one of my personal favorites, and to the, both the guest users and any HDS members are these pre-1850 vital record database volumes. The information for this database, again, comes from 247 volumes, many of which were originally published by NEHGS in the early 1900s, and they cover 158 towns. This is pretty much the definitive source for early Massachusetts vital record information. To search this database, we're going to select it from the drop-down list above. Under Databases, select Massachusetts Vital Records to 1850. Now, you can also then select the particular uh, towns that you're interested in, as you can put in the community. Uh, and most of the 158 towns in this collection are in eastern or central Massachusetts, and there are a handful of western Massachusetts towns as well. There are still a few towns that are currently in separate databases, 
and that will be merged with this database very shortly. To search this, and then really any, da any database in our collection, start by filling in the first or last name. When you first search a database, you always want to start a broad search, then narrow your resource results down rather by adding more information. The year range, record type, and town are all optional. Here I am searching for Mary Lambert, no relation, and leaving all the other fields blank. I'm now going to select the search button, the lower right-hand side again. Here are the results. I got 57 search hits for Mary Lambert, and you can see what type of record it is and where it is. Now, in this case, Mary Lambert uh, it gives you an abbreviation of GR, and then one thing that lets you know a little tip is that GR stands for gravestone record. So this is a birth extracted from a date on a headstone. So I'm going to click on the View button here. But what's nice about the pre-1850 series is once you hit View, go. We're going to see the actual page, in this case from Tisbury, Massachusetts, of the vital records. And I can go through the record and find Mary and other Lamberts. And I can also go through and see the previous page or the next page. Or in fact, jump to a separate volume and type in the citation that I might have, which is really nice. So you can search on the name and also utilize citations you may have in the past to bring up the original page. Okay. Now we're going to try another search. In this case, we're going to use the 1841 to 1910 Massachusetts Vital Records. So first, I'm going to select on Category Vital Records. Database, pull down to Massachusetts Vital Records, 1841 to 1910. And in this case, I am going to pick a familiar name, one of my own family names. But to show you an example of how you can get a, a diverse listing of records if you don't select the record type. Over here is the record type, and you can select birth, marriage, or death. This time I'm leaving it blank, but I'm going to go up to the first name, Alexander, the last name, Poor. And then I'm going to hit Search. I have three results in front of me. Now the first one is a marriage in 1874, a birth in 1878, and a death in 1884. Well, just to give you a little inside scoop, the first one is the marriage of my great-grandparents, the second one is their son's birth, and the third one is the father of the first person up here who was married in 1874, and that's his father's death, all within a 10-year range. So I'm going to select the marriage record here first and hit view. And what I have in front of me is the actual state return record from the city of Boston for my great-grandparents marriage. The primary source, not a transcription, but the original. So what it says here is the date of marriage and the date of marriage is the same as one above it. What I saw in a clue here is that I was looking for my great-grandmother and great-grandfather, Alexander Poor and Calista Gale, but this one above it. Take a glance at some of the fields and see if you see a clue as I'm reading through here. So I have Alexander and Calista's names, where they're a resident of, their age, his or her occupation, where they were born, and the first names of their parents. You see the clue yet? Well, I'll let you in on the secret. Calista and Clara are sisters. The transcription from the city of Boston, the transcriber must have got a little tired on the pen because that's Clara M. Gale, not Clara M. Gall, having the same birthplace of Lowell, Mass, their sister Calista, my great-grandmother, and James and Eunice are the parents. It's a double wedding. So, and we are pleased to see this all on the top of the page and you have all the columns right there so it's a nice example I like to bring up but just one of the many examples of vital records again in the mass vital records you could select the volume in the page so if you have the citation you can actually jump to the record and not even have to search on a name the mass vital record database is also available for you to search without having to put in a name of a person if you're a town historian and you want to go through all the deaths that occurred 
in the town of Stoughton, Massachusetts in 1864. Perhaps you found a gravestone that you couldn't read. Using this database, you can pull up all the deaths and then scroll through one name at a time until you find one that might match up with that gravestone. Or you could search on everyone named Zachariah, who was born in Uxbridge, Mass. in the 1840s, because you're not sure of how they may have spelt that last name. There's a lot of different varieties of uh, ways you can utilize the Mass Federal Records 1841 to 1910, and I'm sure you'll be pleasantly pleased to use it as both a genealogist and as a historian. Massachusetts also has a variety of resources which we're very rich with that are not on our website as well. Uh, not to say that they won't be in the future. Located on the fourth floor, you will find a printed index of the Massachusetts Vital Record Indexes copied at the Department of Vital Statistics by the late Dr. Neil B. Todd. This includes a birth index from 1916 to 1955, a marriage index from 1916 to 1955 and 1966 to 70. And I just want to add a note here. Um, these books were copied because of their condition. When Dr. Todd was copying these, these were in the worst shape and he wanted to make sure that there was a preserved copy both at the Secretary of State's Vital Record Office, rather, the Department of Vital Statistics Vital Record Office and NEHCS. So at the time of Dr. Todd's work, 1956 to 1965 marriage indexes were holding up pretty good. And again, the last one of this series is the deaths, 1916 to 1980. These indexes will provide the name, the location, the year, and the volume and page of the individual record that you can seek. These indexes are a valuable resource and we're very delighted to have them in NEHCS. And stay tuned for a sneak peek of upcoming databases. You might see some of these uh, entries called up. We also have a variety of published vital records for selected cities and towns in pre and post-1850 Massachusetts. These can be located both by the name of the community in our online catalog and in the volumes that are both on the fifth and seventh floors. Now we're going to talk about the state of New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, vital records have been maintained since about the 1640s. In 1866, a law was sought to create statewide compilation of all vital records. However, it received limited support from the town, so it didn't really take off. But by 1905, the New Hampshire State Bureau of Vital Records was created and requested that the town clerks extract data from earlier record ledgers onto individual cards and then submit them to the agency, essentially preserving the older records from the 17th century to the beginning of the 20th century. Now, birth records are available and open digitally up until the year 1900, and death and marriage records are available digitally through 1937. The continuation of the marriage and death records to 1947 will eventually be added to AmericanAncestors.org, our website. We offer 19 vital record New Hampshire databases on AmericanAncestors.org, and these contain over 3 million records. This includes New Hampshire statewide births to the year 1901, marriages and deaths to the year 1937, and these contain over 3 million records. There are also 12 vital record and 6 church record databases for specific New Hampshire towns. Let's do another search of American ancestors. This time we're going to pick some new uh, people in New Hampshire. In this case, I'm going to select the database of New Hampshire births to 1901, deaths and marriages to 1937. I'm going to look for the surname of Hersham. And when I did this initially, um, before doing the webinar, I found 57 hits. So I'm going to narrow this down and entering the first name Eugene. This search tip explains that I can add a uh, spouse or a parent name. So remember, read those search tips. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually add down here under the keyword search the last name of Eugene's mother, her maiden name of Stansbury. So I'm going to include that now and hit search. From what the search I got, I received one hit. And here is the actual record. This record slip provides the information on not only Eugene's birth, but also his parents. As you can see, here's his father's name and mother's name, the birthplace of the father, his residence, and occupation. The also, which is very unique to New Hampshire records, it gives you the age 
uh, early on of the bride, uh, rather not the bride, but the father and the mother. And this is very useful because in some cases, if the father and mother of the course of a marriage was listed, it will also tell you if the parents were deceased. So that might be a valuable clue for you. At any HCS, we have other vital record resources for use for the state of New Hampshire. We have a wonderful collection for 17th through 17th century through 1830s era New Hampshire research. This collection is called the New Hampshire Town Record Series. There is a statewide index that will give you the name, town, volume, and page for the records in this series. A uh, tip I'd like to have you remember, however, is the following. Since these are from town records, you will also find vital records mixed in with regular town records. So you find that your ancestor was a constable or his tax records or the cattle mark that he had mixed in with the birth, marriages, and deaths. So in the index, you'll want to find a citation with the MR for marriage record or FR for family record. Now, an MR marriage record could be the marriage intention of the marriage itself. Now, a family record, however, is often a group of family members recorded with birth, marriage, and deaths, or can it be a birth or a death for an individual person? So they can be families or they can be individual records. If it does not list the MR or FR, in most cases there will be a reference to your ancestor's name in the town records without a vital record associated. It's still valuable to search, however, it's not going to provide you the vital records that you're hoping for. We also have on microfilm pre-1900 New Hampshire vital records and marriage and death from 1901 to 1947. Okay, next we're going to talk about Rhode Island. And Rhode Island may be the smallest state in New England, however it is not short on valuable records for the genealogists. Starting in 1647, towns were required to record all marriages. And later on, birth and death were not mandated at first, but were eventually recorded by the town clerks as well. Many of the communities did not however, start collecting birth, marriage, and deaths um, at the earliest point of their settlement, but soon after incorporation record these records. And you'll find that most towns have records from about the earliest time there may have been a settled minister or a town clerk. In 1853, Rhode Island required that all birth, marriage, and death were to be recorded on the town and state level. On AmericanAncestors.org, we offer six vital record databases uh, that cover over 1.8 million records. This includes the Arnold Vital Records Compilation for Rhode Island from 1636 to 1850 with over 370,000 records. The Rhode Island Historical Cemetery Database, and, database excuse me, has 422,000 records. An index to all birth, marriage, and death records in the city of Providence is also included, and this contains over one million records. And for church records, we have the catalog of members from the First Baptist Church of Providence, and also an individual vital record for a town of Jamestown, Rhode Island, covering 1671 to 1800. And these two databases combined offer over 5,000 records. The most significant contribution to the genealogical work of Rhode Islanders was compiled by the late genealogist James N. Arnold in 21 volumes. This set includes birth, marriage and deaths, as well as church and newspaper records covering 1636 to 1850. In the coming months, this database will undergo a facelift and include digital images from the published books instead of just the transcriptions. A revised index will also be implemented to help you better search the Arnold Vital Records. Here's an example of how I search this database on American Ancestors. Now, for this example, I'm going to select the name, I'll type in Elizabeth Buffum. Now I'm going to put in the year of her birth, 1806. Under the category, again, I'll choose Vital Records. And for the database, I'll select the Rhode Island Vital Records 1636 to 1850, which is the Arnold database. After that, I'm going to go down to the bottom and I'm going to select search. And now I will have a transcription of Elizabeth Buffum's birth in 1806 in Smithfield, Rhode Island. You see that she was born on the ninth day of the 12th month to Arnold and Rebecca Buffum. 
Now, here is a sneak peek of what is going to be online, and this is actually Elizabeth's record of her birth in 1806 right here on the screen. And they're grouped together, as you can see, by the name of the parents. So they're like family group records, if you will, of the actual individual events. Because if you look here under both of them, they're not alphabetical by the first name, and they're surely not in chronological order, but they're grouped together again by the parents. So here's a group of Thomas and Maria's children, Arnold and Rebecca's children, William and Anne, uh, down below. So, on a side note, I want to let you know that Elizabeth Buffum would later become Elizabeth Buffum Chase, an influential activist in the anti-slavery, women's rights, prison reform movements of the 19th century. Some additional Rhode Island resources at NEHGS you might want to try includes the statewide vital records and indexes for birth and marriages from 1853 to 1894, and the deaths from 1853 through to 1945. These are located on microfilm on the fourth floor. And the last state we're going to chat about for New England is this great state of Vermont. This northerly state has recordings that generally began as early as the 1770s. Many of the earlier settled towns did not, however, record vital records from the earliest settlement, but there are some exceptions. In 1857, Vermont required that a copy of all birth, marriage, and deaths should be sent to the state. Unfortunately, this was not always followed by every city and town clerk. The two earliest microfilm series of Vermont records are broken into the pre-1871 series and the 1871-1908 to series. Within this series, gravestones prior to 1870 were transcribed to compensate for the poor return of death records at the town clerk level. And in 1919, the state of Vermont began a statewide index to record all vital records, present and past. We offer 16 vital record databases on American ancestors for Vermont that include over 4.3 million records. This includes the Vermont birth, marriage, and death to the year 2008, making it the most recent compilation of vital records for New England. Containing in this is over 4 million records. We also have 13 vital record and two church record databases for specific Vermont cities and towns for your viewing pleasure. Let's search on American ancestors for one of the more than 4 million Vermont vital records online. I'm a baseball fan, so I thought this would be kind of fun. For this search, I'm going to search for Baseball Hall of Famer and Red Sox catcher and also Chicago White Sox catcher, Carlton Fisk. So I enter the first name, Carlton, last name, Fisk, selecting the category of vital records, the database of birth, marriages, and deaths to 2008 for the state of Vermont. And then I'm going to scroll down once again and select search. Here's an example of the actual birth record of who we commonly called Pudge, Carlton Fisk, of the Boston Red Sox, and you may remember from the famous 1975 World Series, him pushing that ball over the Green Monster. And here is his birth record. Born in Bellows Falls, and he is here with his full name, Carlton Ernest Fisk, born December 26, 1947. He was seven pounds uh, at birth. His father's name and place of birth his mother's name and place of birth. She's actually from Mankato, Minnesota, and his father was from Charlestown, New Hampshire. It also tells me, tells me the amount of children born to this couple and other children now living uh, and dead. And unfortunately, uh, it also indicates that there was one child that did not live past infancy. Now, you may also wish to search our collection of published vital records for selected towns in Vermont on the fifth floor as well. So again, using our library catalog by searching under the town, under the title, or the keyword search for the town will provide you with a valuable list of resources, both historical and in some cases transcriptions, for many of the Vermont cities and towns. Here's a couple of tips. Events may have occurred in one town, but were recorded in another. 
give you a perfect example. My grandmother was from Milton, Massachusetts, and her husband was from Everett, Massachusetts. Their marriage occurred in Milton, so it's recorded there, but he filed the intention in Everett, so it was also recorded there. Now, there could be even the case where you might find a marriage recorded in three towns. Say if I was married in my hometown, my wife recorded the, we did the intention of marriage license in hers, and I was married in Boston. So don't be surprised. And I must admit, it's always good to look at each one because each clerk may have recorded a little different information. Now, don't assume that if you cannot find a vital record that the event must have happened in a different town. In some cases, because of the limitation of vital records, the event may have not been recorded at all. However, you may try one of the many substitutes that NEHS has to offer or speak to one of our experts to give you some guidance on how to actually solve a missing vital record problem. We have things like church records, censuses, probate records, land records and court records, tax records, military pensions, gravestones, obituaries, and journals that may give you that clue to that birth, marriage, and death you're seeking. It may have been recorded on some other level, and these may be one of the substitute sources you may wish to try. You can also access an alphabetical list of all of our databases on AmericanAncestors.org. As you see here, we have an alphabetical listing of our databases, and you can select any letter and search through and browse a database that may be of interest to you. Now you can access our library catalog from AmericanAncestors.org, but a quick way of doing it is simply by typing in library.nehgs.org. This will bring up the library catalog, and in the case of searching for a town, if to see if there's a published vital record or an individual role of microfilm, for the, the case of our vital records talk, you might want to try a title search or a keyword search um, to determine what we have for an individual community you are searching. Here's that sneak peek I promised you. I'm going to talk about what's coming soon to AmericanAncestors.org. We have Connecticut Federal Records to 1870, the Barber Collection. As you, I mentioned, this is an ongoing process, which will be finished with 136 volumes by the end of the year. We also have the Massachusetts Federal Record Index, 1916 to 1976. So those volumes done by Dr. Neil Todd, all that hard work will now be digital for you to look at online to aid you in the records that have not been released by the Commonwealth, but you can access from the Vital Record Office or the city or town clerk. Massachusetts City Directories, 1841 to 1910. Massachusetts State Censuses, 1855 and 1865. New Hampshire City Directories, 1823 to 1964. Rhode Island City Directories, 1820 to 1963. And lastly, Vermont Vital Records 1909 to 2008. Thank you very much for attending this webinar and hope to see you at NEHGS or in an upcoming webinar. And give it back now to Ginevra. Thanks, David, for that wonderful presentation. Um, so now let's answer your questions. If you have a question for David, David, about anything he's covered in this presentation, please go ahead and type it in the question field on the right of your screen. Um, David, I've been getting questions throughout the presentation, so um, I'll ask a few right now. Uh, the first one, um, Noreen asks if you could actually just review the restrictions placed on Massachusetts vital records. Sure. Sure. <clears throat> sure, I'd be glad to review this. Massachusetts has a rule where vital records need to be 92 years released after the date. So for instance, right now you can get records from 19, 1841 to 1920, and records from 1921 to 1925 will not be available to the end of the year 2017. Well, actually the beginning of the year 2017 when the records of 1925 through December 31st have reached the mature age of 92 years to again protect the identity of individuals. 
These records will then be transferred to the Massachusetts State Archives and be in the public domain. These restrictions, however, don't limit you to looking at Massachusetts records. It limits the ones that have illegitimacies or adoptions. Marriages and deaths, for the most part, are open records and don't have any restrictions. And you should be able to get them from both the Department of Vital Statistics or from the City of Town Clerk's Office. The case of the births is the reason for the restriction of 92 years. And I hope that answers your question. Thanks, David. And uh, thanks, Noreen, for that question. Um, Elizabeth uh, has a question about um, one of her ancestors who was living in Maine in the 1640s, so before it was a state. Um, how, where can she find uh, those vital records? Would they be in Maine or perhaps Massachusetts? Okay, now for your town in Maine, if it's one of the 72 towns, it would be part of the pre-1892 vital records series. And you might be very lucky, and the records from the 17th century may be preserved, and you can actually actually get the records, and you can find them both on our website, or you might find them um, in a published series. Now, in the case of 17th century records, there's also another thing to consider. The earliest settlement may have been accompanied by a minister or a clergyman of some sort. So you may also want to look for church records, which is one of the sources that we ultimately use when vital records aren't into play yet. Remember, there was no state law, for that matter, provincial or colonial law, that required the town clerks to record them. Some of them did generally, but in most cases, the sacraments in the 17th century would have been recorded, so you may find the baptism of your ancestors. A good source for Maine families is the Libby Noyce Davis, uh, which has the fam early families of Maine and New Hampshire in it. So you might want to look at that, see uh, if there are any records there. And also feel free to come in any HGS or call us and we can give you some more suggestions. Okay, and um, Lynette has a question about um, what exactly is a marriage intention and were they required? And it might, of course, it might vary state by state, but if you could give kind of a general response. A marriage intention was just that. It was the intention of the bride and groom to file their request to be married. In most cases, an intention, this would be posted in the town clerk's office so people could see that uh, this young man or old man and young lady <laughs> were, uh, had their intentions of marriage. Now, this was a case in one way to prevent uh, polygamy, and also for the parents of the bride to know that she has her intention. Now you might note that sometimes intentions are not recorded in the town where the bride's from, but from the groom's town, and as long as they're legally posted, and that's all that needed to be done. Uh, in the earlier days, if you look at church records in England, marriage bonds, the parent, the bands of marriage were posted in the church in red. It follows the same tradition. Okay, great. And um, we have a question about, actually a few questions about viewing um, records that we might have at the library but aren't currently online. Um, what services are available for people um, who want to view those records? So what we have at the library, if you, uh, our, our research service department, which you can come into the library, they can do the research for you. Uh, there's a rate of $60 an hour for members or $80 an hour for non-members, and they have a two-hour minimum. But this will allow them to undertake the research into the vital records or any form of research that you might have uh, if you can't come to any HGS. We also offer a consultation service where we can offer you advice and guide you through the process if you're unsure on how to research a particular brick wall or maybe explain further one of the many collections we have at NEHGS to your benefit. So in both cases, we do have uh, services available um, for both research services and consultations. And then lastly, I'd mentioned under Tories, some of the resources that were in print, you can actually go in and request photocopies of certain cited, cited works uh, that Tory mentions for marriages in case you can't come here and photocopy them yourselves. Great, and uh, Lynette has another question about, um, well, she asks, how serious were people about reporting births to the town clerk? Was there a penalty for not doing this? And uh, she's specifically asking about Connecticut. 
Well, it wasn't until the 1890s that it um, became more of a state registered issue. So if you do not record the birth of your child, um, one of the things that comes about is that later on when the child is going for uh, voting rights or for school, there would needed to be some proof of identity. Now, back in the 1700s and the 1600s, you know, it was a haphazard collection. I mean, people were in communities. You definitely know there are church records that have the baptisms for the children. Why isn't there a copy recorded? It's interesting to note that in a lot of cases, the sexton of the church who recorded the sacramental records was one of the more learned people in the town and may also have been elected as the town clerk or the parish clerk. So sometimes there's no need to record it twice, <laughs> at least that's the theory that some of us historians have, uh, in that that might excuse them for not recording them. But in most cases, there was no financial penalty um, there may be later on in Connecticut's history. Uh, I don't know of a physical dollar amount, but I can tell you that for the most part, <clears throat> by the late 19th century, uh, people were more apt to record their children's vital records or their, obviously their marriage, which was a legal uh, obligation, and a death for a legal purpose of maybe closing an estate, so you would want to. Births would be the first thing really ignored. Marriages and deaths would almost be more apt to be recorded at most all times from the 19th century on. Okay, thanks, and thanks, Lynette, for your um, other question. And uh, David, um, if people want to see an original record held at perhaps um, a town hall or through the town clerk, um, do they have to physically go to that office or can they call for a copy or how does that work? Well, I'm going to use Massachusetts as an example for this and it's really a case by case uh, problem that each town clerk has their own set of rules. Some of them will not take these original volumes out of the vaults. Some of them might have a microfilm or a microfiche copy so they can perhaps let you view it and maybe not take the original out. Some have photocopied the entire old books or scanned them, so they'll send them to you and certify the page. But for the most part, a typical town clerk will, if you're doing it through the mail, they're going to take the original out, type into a form. Now, this standardized form may or may not include all of the fields that you have uh, in the original records, or maybe there are not enough fields. Um, so you can get a transcribed certified copy of the original. Will they take and make a scanned copy of all of them? Uh, generally not. Your best bet is to contact the town clerk, ask them if they are not allowing you to get a copy scanned or photocopied and sent through the mail. If you make a visit or send someone, maybe a cousin who lives close to that town or a friend or a genealogist, if they can use a digital camera without a flash to copy the selected pages you wish, wish so you can see the original primary source before it was sent into the state or published, whatever have you. So it's every state and every town is a little different, unfortunately. All right. Thank you, David. And thank you, everyone, who's uh, written in with their questions. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have. So if we haven't gotten to your question, uh, please feel free to um, contact the library at library at nehgs.org. Also, if you have more detailed questions about the specifics of your research, how to locate records or ancestors, or how to break down brick walls, you may want to consider scheduling either a consultation or hiring our research services team. If you're interested in learning more about these services, you can write to the email addresses on the current slide. I'll also provide this information in my follow-up email to you tomorrow. And thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey on today's presentation. As we continue to expand and improve our online offerings, all feedback is extremely helpful. Be sure to explore our website, AmericanAncestors.org, which offers access to millions of records covering New England, New York, and beyond. And if you're ever in the Boston area, please feel free to stop by our research library and archives. We're open to the public and hold a vast collection of published genealogies, biographies, local histories, microfilms, manuscripts, and more. And if you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit visit our online learning center, AmericanAncestors.org slash learning hyphen center. I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.